Jet lag be damned, it's a pleasure to be back at Mines and Money. Uh, I am the mercenary geologist. You can find me at mercenarygeologist.com. Uh, and we run 24-7 streaming audio, mercenarygeologist.fm. And you can join over 41,000 Twitter followers at Mercenary Geo. We have a lot of fun with our Twitter feed on a variety of subjects. Uh, to keep the SEC and IROC happy, I've got to have a disclaimer here. Nothing I say today can be construed uh, as an offer to buy or sell stock on long or short any, any item, including commodities. I am not a certified financial advisor. This is my opinion only. Today I'm going to talk about North American markets, commodities, and mining investment. First thing we're going to review is what's happened in the major U.S. markets, and I've used as my benchmark the starting point January of 2003, which can be arguably be uh, said to be the beginning of the commodities bull market led by gold. Uh, in early tw 2003, gold went over 300 bucks and stayed there for the first time in a long time. But you can see the way the Dow has gone up and up and up with a brief hiatus, and it was relatively brief for the global economic crisis that lasted, what, 15 or 18 months, and, and then the U.S. stock market started to roll again, uh, basically driven, at, I think, as a bubble by the Fed to replace the housing bubble. Uh, here's the 12-year S&P 500, looks much the same. Uh, both those markets are, are, if they did not hit all-time highs within the last week, they certainly have, uh, or in the last day they have in the last week or so. Uh, NASDAQ is over 5,000, the S&P 500 over 2,100, the Dow well above 18,000. And this uh, shows what happened and what the catalyst was, and that was uh, in, in, from uh, 2003 to 2006, the housing bubble, again created by the U.S. Fed, uh, uh, went at first exponential, then went parabolic, and then the exponential collapse down to January of 2009 and the height of the global economic crisis. Uh, what, we, what I would encourage you to look at is, is the last year or so of that chart. And over the last six months, U.S. housing starts have once again exceeded a million units per month uh, for the first time since the global financial crisis. And they look like they've somewhat stabilized in that range. Uh, and here's what happened with the dollar index, and that's been the story lately. Uh, uh, we hit, what, uh, a 12-year high on the dollar index last week when it went over 100. It's still corrected. It's since corrected back a bit to, uh, to 98 plus or minus. Uh, but you see this exponential rise of the U.S. dollar index, uh, and that started in July. It actually started on July 11th. And that was the day that the U.S. dollar index uh, went above 80 and it stayed there. So we've seen a 20% increase in the U.S. dollar over the last, what is that, July 11th to March is uh, uh, over the last eight months, I suppose. Um, that is basically unprecedented. Uh, and in my opinion, it's a matter of the U.S. dollar is looked upon as the lesser of all evil because, once again, it's fiat currency. I'm uh, uh, one of the people who think that the only real money in the world is gold, and gold should be a safe haven and an insurance policy and not an investment or a strategic speculation. Uh, but anyway, we'll get back to the U.S. dollar index when we, when we look at commodities prices a bit. And that's what I want to look at here. Here's the, the oil price. We see the peaking of above $140 a barrel in, uh, in 2007 uh, or early 2008 before it collapsed as 
all commodities and all markets when they go exponential, they will have a parabolic top or even a spike in this case, and then they come screaming down the, uh, the other side. So you've seen this, uh, uh, we saw that during the global economic crisis where oil went from $140 a barrel all the way down to uh, somewhere around $30 a barrel. Didn't stay there very long. Uh, we have a bit of a dif different situation in oil markets now. Uh, we basically have oversupply. It became very evident in, say, maybe September or so, when we had lots of geopolitical turmoil in the world, and we didn't see the oil price respond. And that was foreshadowing what was to come. And that's basically, we have an oversupply of oil, mainly driven by U.S. shale production. U.S. Uh, in February produced 12.4 million barrels of oil a day. We have stormed past Russia. I say we because with this accent, and my son, Tan, I obviously live in the southwest U.S. Um, but uh, what we have really seen uh, is unprecedented growth. Uh, Saudis and Russia are being left behind in oil production. There's little reason to suppose that U.S. oil production is not going to continue to grow. It may flatline by the end of the year, but uh, but it, it is growing month by month, and we just have an oversupply. The real problem in the United States is we can't export oil. Uh, in 1975, during, uh, toward the end of the first oil crisis, Nixon and, well, one of the things Nixon did, including taking us off the gold standard and imposing price controls, uh, is he got passed through Congress a law that U.S. couldn't export oil. So we, we have been left with this uh, problem that we have a bunch of hungry, heavy oil refineries on the Gulf Coast. We have a, an abundance of light, sweet, crude coming from shale oil producers, and we don't have any place to refine it. Uh, last week, we hit an all-time or 80-year high in oil storage, 80 years, well, that was the height of, of, the, of the Depression, what, 1935. 452 million barrels of U.S. oil in storage. We use 18, 19 million barrels a day, so we're looking at well over, what is that, uh, something on the order of 250 days of supply in storage. Um, and until the U.S. Uh, uh, knocks back the export law. Congress is uh, well on its way to doing that. We'll see if our socialistic President Obama will be willing to sign it. Uh, but basically, we import heavy oil from, uh, from Mexico and the Venezuelans, and we need to export our light crew to refineries that need it, specifically in this part of the world. Here's the 12-month gold price. Now, this is the average monthly gold price, so it takes out some of the, uh, some of the perturbations in the curve. Uh, but we see the uh, parabolic top at uh, somewhere on a monthly basis around $1,800 a month. And then we saw the slide down, but it's since stabilized. Uh, and the weakness in the gold price over the last, since July 11th, really, when the dollar is, is, is in U.S. dollars only, if you look at the gold price in most other currencies, uh, it has either gone up or, at, at worst, it's been stable. In Canadian dollars, you're looking at $1,600 gold right now. Uh, but what we have seen is a flattening uh, of the gold price uh, over the last, what, uh, close to two years. It's become very range-bound. Uh, my point would be, if you can't make money at $1,100 or $1,200 gold, then you don't belong in the gold business. And, and, uh, and I, I'm a proponent of the idea there's lots of gold companies out there that underperform. We'll talk about that in a minute here. Um, here's the spot copper price. Um, and, you know, we hit $4 copper a couple of times. It stayed there for a while. Uh, it, it, 
went down a bit. It stabilized in the upper $3 range. Uh, and then it took another downturn, but it stabilized basically in the 320 to 330 range for about six months. Uh, copper this morning, I think, is 277 a pound. Do the math. What's 330? That's a 60 cent drop in the price of copper over the last four or five months. Well, what's the U.S. dollar done? The price of copper has remained the same in constant dollars. This phenomenon of a dropping copper price is simply due to the, to the strength of the U.S. dollar. We're at the same point we were when, in U.S. dollars when it was 3.30 a pound. This is what we require in new copper per year. Some of you have been to this place, and if you haven't, you'll probably recognize it. This is Bingham Canyon, and it's in its lifetime, it has supplied the same amount of copper that we use per year. We've got to find a Bingham Canyon every year, and we're not doing that. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, you know this mine first produced in 1903, so it has continuous production for 110 years. It is it was the first bulk mineable copper deposit on the planet. Uh, it has at least 50 years of reserves. Below the pit now, there's an ore body called a star deposit, runs 2% copper. Uh, it's, it's a scar and it's got good gold values. There's a world-class Molly deposit uh, just off the side of this pit. So uh, what we're faced with, and bear in mind that I've spent most of my career as an exploration economic geologist, uh, we need to find one of these per year and we're not finding it. You can't build an electrical line without copper, and 25% of the world's population still goes to bed in the dark. They don't turn on a light switch. A significant portion of those are here in Eastern Asia, and it is being electrified very quickly. The other uh, region of the world that does, still doesn't have electricity is uh, Sub-Sahara Africa. That's going to be a while yet to develop. But here's the point I want to make about mar metals market fundamentals, and I remain, even though we are in a period of low commodity prices, I remain a secular uh, bull in commodities, especially in copper. We have the BICs and their brethren, and, and notice I didn't say the BRICs because Russia doesn't count for a bunch of reasons. Number one is the demographics are worth, worse than Japan, no young people, but that's Brazil, India, Indonesia, and China. Those countries and smaller emerging market countries will continue to grow. Uh, this generates supply short falls just with the general year-over-year -year growth from demand and population. Uh, we find that deposits are tougher to find. Mines are tougher to develop because we have geopolitics and corrupt and unstable governments all over the world and resource nationalism and environmental NGO opposition, aboriginal opposition worldwide. So uh, what we used to say, it took 10 years to build a mine. Well, that's now increased. We're looking at, at time frames of, of 10 to to 15 years, maybe even 20 years. We're not finding enough good deposits. We're not supplying, uh, particularly in copper, enough new copper to the market. So for these reasons, I still remain a secular bull in commodities. Uh, let's switch gears a bit and talk about where new, new deposits are found, and they're found by the juniors, uh, and specifically the world's greatest junior exchange, uh, pardon my uh, disparagement of the Australian Stock Exchange, but uh, the Toronto Venture Exchange is where most venture capital for exploration and mining comes in the world. And again, we see the performance uh, basically tracking commodities uh, from 2003 till December of 2007, at which point a, an event happened called Nova Gold uh, at, at uh, Galore Creek failed. Uh, and it took, the, it took the business down and it kind of foreshadowed the beginning of the 
global economic crisis in December of 2007. But you can make a case that the gold mining business led the world out of, or North America especially, out of the global economic crisis because it started getting better in January of 2009. We saw big financings. And once again, uh, it, we, we saw a peak in uh, the first quarter of 2011, and then it has gone exponential on the downtick again. Uh, this, this exchange is in a world of hurt. Uh, we thought we were at bottom a couple of times. It stabilized at 1,000, but now it's hovering near its all-time low uh, or around uh, 650 or so, uh, and I'm not convinced it's not going below that. Uh, when you're evaluating junior resource companies, there's four things you need to look at. Share structure, you want a tight share structure. You want people that have been in the business, have been successful in this business before. You want technical guys at the top, either geologists or engineers. You want to make sure that they haven't bankrupted three companies because they're no longer, in my opinion, venture capitalists or entrepreneurs. And finally, you want a good project, something uh, that can, can be developed by that junior uh, and then we've added one over the course of the last few years is the markets. You need cash or hand or the ability to raise capital in one way, shape, or form without serious dilution. A variety of ways to do that. Um, but here's the problem in the Toronto Venture Exchange right now. We have 1,200 exploration and mining companies. Fully 50% have negative working capital. What's that mean? It means they're not paying their bills. They're not paying, they cannot uh, keep up with their short-term bills. It's got nothing to do with long-term debt because uh, uh, that is not part of uh, working capital. Uh, they, and at the present, they're failing to meet minimum listing requirements of the stock exchange. Uh, there's been extreme lack of delistings over the last three years. I think that's because the TMX Group, which is, owns the Toronto Venture Exchange, a publicly listed company, and wants the $3 million plus in annual revenues it generates from these, uh, from these juniors. I think it's conflict or interest. There's a group of analysts and newsletter writers are beating the drum with the idea of squeaky wheel, uh, uh, will eventually get grease uh, and get some of these companies delisted. Until that happens, I don't think we can uh, expect uh, the, the markets to improve. Uh, traditional sources for exploration mining, equity, bank debt, institutional funds, government subsidies, a lot of those have left the market. Now we're looking at non-traditional sources, strategic alliances, uh, private equity or sovereign funds, offtake contracts, uh, streamers, royalty streams, uh, things such as that. Um, so there's way, there are ways out of our dilemma right now. It has to do with non-traditional ways of funding. Uh, change gears a bit. What makes a good mine? Well, as we all know, the, uh, the mining industry operates in boom and bust commodity cycles. Uh, the timing of development and production is key. You basically want to go into production at a time of early, of low commodity prices and hit them on the uptick. Uh, you need low capital expenditures per unit of metal, and that's what's killed a lot of the miners uh, during this downtick is, is high capex projects are not going, being built. And finally, you always want to be in the lowest operating quartile of cost curve because then you're insulated against the bust in, uh, in commodity prices, which we know occur. It's a boom and bust business. Recently, I've uh, done a study of, of seven large go major gold mining companies, but I want to show you the way they've underperformed in the greatest bull market for gold, gold we've ever, ever experienced. 11 years, from January of 03 to February of 2013, gold itself was up a whopping 260%. Uh, in the meantime, Barry Gold lost 33% of its market cap, Gold Corp gained only 55%, now compare that with the price of gold, and Newmont Mining lost 13%. Seven gold mining majors, what we found in our study that time and time again, OPEX is capitalized as what we call investment in mining properties, essentially sustaining capital. Uh, co companies have focused on growth of production and reserves, 
Uh, they've gone into debt for failed acquisitions. They've declared dividends on debt they've raised, which I think is a bit unholy. Uh, then they've written down their assets. Uh, what we found is the cash flow has been significantly less than needed to fund corporate obligations. We've come up with a measure called the adequacy ratio, which is revenues of gold uh, 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 sold divided by OPEX plus IMP investment in mining properties plus debt repayment plus dividends. If a company is healthy, it has an adequacy ratio of greater than one. You look at these seven major miners, none over the period have had an adequacy ratio of over one. Only one of the 11 years when gold hit its all-time high did the group have an adequacy ratio of over to one. This means these are failed companies. Major gold miners did not reward their shareholders. It's a flawed business model, in my opinion. They're unprofitable. Uh, they focused on growth of production, resources, and reserves. They, when they need to focus on margin, on high cost margin, be in the lowest quartile, they've ignored that. Mining is a value industry, not a growth industry, until the major gold mining companies focus on the quality of ounces produced at high margin versus the quantity of ounces produced, they will not be successful. Uh, when you're evaluating a company for mining investment, you need to do your due diligence. Uh, an old saying of mine, high grade is wonderful. Every good geologist knows that uh, grade is king. Most junior mining companies exist solely to mine the stock market. You've got to be very careful there. Major gold miners have used equity and debt to pay their dividends. They have not been profitable over the last 11 years. As Mark Twain said in 1863, a mine is a hole in the ground with a liar standing beside it. That still holds. And the question then becomes with what I said here, why would you speculate in such high-risk stocks? Well, I'll give you exact reason. These are the top 10 gold companies in 2013. None of them have been very profitable, but look at it this way. The ones that are highlighted started as exploration juniors on either the Vancouver Stock Exchange or the Toronto Venture Exchange. So some companies are successful. You just have to be aware of the frogs mas masquerading as princes. I run a free subscription newsletter. Sign up uh, for my musings at my website. I'm out of time. Thank you very much.